Sales. It's important for any organization, whether you own a nonprofit, a startup, an SME, or a multinational organization. Sales is critical for your business's growth and development. In the sales cycle, there are a number of aspects at play, identifying leads, pitching and presenting to leads, negotiating, and account management. The best sales teams and organizations know that sales is all about delivering a valuable solution to their customers. For many of the sustainability champions we feature on our podcast, one of the unique selling propositions of their brand is that they're sustainable. Whether it's diverting thousands of tons of plastic from landfill each year or a circular approach to their materials, whatever it may be, selling these ideas to customers is key to how many of the sustainability champions on our channel grow their businesses. That's why in today's second episode of our professional series, we speak to Steve Bussey, sales coach, mentor, and founder of SalesStrong. SalesStrong is an organization based in the UK that's one of the industry's leading sales training and consultancy providers. With clients all over the world, Steve and the sales coaches at SalesStrong guarantee their clients' sales growth with their help. During today's episode, I want to explore what it takes for a sustainable organization to sell more and how sales teams can communicate their organization's value to decision makers when it comes to sustainability. I hope you enjoy this second episode in our three-part professional series. Hey, Steve, thanks so much for joining the Sustainability Champions podcast. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Daniel. It's a real pleasure to be on the show, actually. Well, thank you so much. So the, the way I like to start these conversations by getting just a kind of big picture view on what SalesStrong does. So what is the elevator pitch for SalesStrong? Well, we're a sales training, coaching, consulting business. Uh, we're lucky enough to work all over the world with some of the world's biggest companies. And we've probably coached or trained well over 20,000 salespeople now. Um, we tend to focus primarily on business to business sales, particularly where the selling process is a little bit more complex. And we guarantee growth with all the organizations that we work with. Guarantee is a very good word, um, but that, that's incredible. I mean, um, 20,000 salespeople over the course of of sales strong's existence that's a lot of people and during that time i mean what, what are some of the I, i'm sure you you start to see patterns are, are there any specific challenges that you frequently encounter as you're uh training these larger organizations in a more complex sales cycle or sales process uh yeah i think uh, the main challenge that I've seen through the years that I've been doing this is that salespeople um, are sometimes left to their own devices. So, you know, sales is a profession. It's one that I've been part of for 30 years. I'm very proud to be a salesperson, but that's not always seen as, as the case. And I think some of that is that quite often salespeople are under-trained. Um, you know, it's binary. Sales is also a meritocracy, which is what I love about it. You are either successful or you're not. And if you're not, you tend not to last very long in sales. Mm -hmm. So you've certainly got to learn quickly. But uh, I think salespeople would really benefit. Of course I would, because I have a bias towards coaching and training. <laughs> but I really think that there is sometimes a lack of professionalism in our profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, people would benefit from refreshing and upskilling on a constant basis. I would say that's that's number one about salespeople. Uh, number two is, uh, I think there's a real change happening in the industry, uh, a change that's been accelerated by COVID. You know, we're doing this podcast digitally. I think salespeople are grappling with how to sell in a hybrid world where t traditionally we may have uh, been able to get out and look people in the eye and shake their hands and get a sense of those customers in a three-dimensional way. Now it's very two-dimensional. So how do you adapt to this world, which has some advantages? Mm. So it has a productivity advantage. But what can happen is that the conversations are quite transactional. You have to work harder to build a relationship. Um, so I think salespeople are grappling with that. Not only salespeople, I think sales organizations. Every business is looking at the structure of its sales team and thinking, well, actually, do I need these expensive sales consultants out on the road? Or can I focus more around digital interactions with customers, whether that is 
automated or whether that is having a human being who's on the phone or is just doing calls. So again, I think, you know, that's being grappled with at the moment. Uh, I think the third one, as we come into 2023, is, um, you know, there there are a number of organisations that are feeling the pressure. They're feeling the pressure of inflation. They're feeling the pressure of rising energy costs. They're seeing uh, supply chain constraints. I think almost every organisation is probably looking much closer at its cost base. And when that happens, it just means that in sales, we've got to lift our game, right? We have to be able to demonstrate the value even more effectively than we have to when times are good, because the competition is going to get tougher. Uh, you're going to meet more professional buyers. Commercial procurement people are going to be introduced into the process. Um, and that means if you're not on your A game, you're, you're probably going to find it tough. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, front of mind, they're probably the three, you know, a couple of those more recent, one of them a little bit more longstanding. Yeah. And thank you for for outlining that. And and I think that those are interesting and, and actually I have to admit not what I was expecting, um, but I can completely see um, where you're coming from with them. What I find really interesting and, and really the purpose of this episode, because it is a little different than what we normally do, uh, as we were talking about before we started the recording, is that... Um, I normally speak to companies that are working within sustainability, but what we're doing with with this episode in this series is is working or, or speaking to to companies that can help those sustainability champions, as we call them, to do yep. their business more effectively and more efficiently. And and I think that these three challenges that you've outlined, which is basically salespeople left being left to their own devices, things have changed in a in a post COVID and during COVID world, and of course the, the pressure of increased costs um out of those three uh the one that jumps out at me uh, the fastest and the most obviously and, and perhaps this is the more long-standing question that you're referring to is demonstrating value and that's something that as a salesperson myself i recognize is one of the most important things that a salesperson has to do is demonstrate value especially within the context of their prospects or clients depending on who you are um world and and the challenges that they're facing. And so if we're looking at at training professionals who are selling a sustainable product and and we can stick to the B2B world since that's that's the area that you you focus on and it's my personal preference. Um how does a salesperson go into uh, a conversation especially considering that there are increased costs right now. Companies are certainly in Silicon Valley right now. There, there is a lot of layoffs happening with, you know, all the big tech companies. H how can a salesperson demonstrate that sustainability is an important thing to keep in mind? Because I think for many organizations, they're looking to cut costs and sustainability can be seen as a nice to have. So, I mean, how as a salesperson do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, I think if we, if we think about, um, value and why people make buying decisions they make it for rational reasons so what's the return on investment mm -hmm. what's the value what's the price you know that's a logical economic decision making process but on the other side there's also an emotional element to it which is do i believe in the idea of sustainability do i see the value of it intuitively um and do i connect with a desire to make you know the world a better place um, in terms of reducing the impact of climate change. So uh, I always say to salespeople when I'm working with them, it's both sides of that decision-making process you need to demonstrate value around. So there's the emotional bit, you know, can you position the mission, the vision, the view mm -hmm. of why sustainability uh, is so important. But on the other side, particularly if you're talking with people who are making financial decisions, you've got to be able to show them that that's a sensible financial decision they're making to invest in either sustainable products or services or to do something around sustainable uh, sustainability in their own organization. Um, now, I, I do think that the, the argument is getting easier to make around the economic benefit because you've got worldwide legislation, which is creating pressure on organizations that don't engage in some form of sustainability agenda. You've got fines that are happening if people don't uh, 
start to work in this space. So I think the financial argument is getting easier because mm -hmm. of the regulatory environment that we're in. Um, I also think um, it's getting easier because you've got you've got organisations in the sustainability space uh, now looking at how they can put that argument together. So if I go to an organisation that is looking to make investments and I can suggest that by making an investment in land in the develop, developing world to protect that land from deforestation, maybe keep a biodiversity, there are two aspects to that investment that become interesting. One is, should I actually get a straight return off the investment? The second one is, I'm going to create carbon credits. Uh, now, they're either, either going to offset something in my business that is creating carbon, um, or I potentially could trade those carbon credits, and there is a value in doing that trade. Mm -hmm. So I think as uh, if you're selling in the sustainability space to organizations, it's to remember that it's all very well playing on the emotional side of why this is a good thing for people on the planet. But actually, you need to also be able to demonstrate that quantifiable benefit. Why is this a good investment for the company? Yeah, and I think that it's very true because I think it, the, the emotional side for many, not all, uh, is kind of the easy bit. Uh, people are, are starting starting to subscribe to it a little bit more. It, it really depends on the person. Um, but I think, yeah, to, to your point, sometimes I, I find at least because I, I, I'm a salesperson as well, and, and I'm also pitching products and, and services. And so um, you kind of have to, what I'm finding is you sort of have to, as as you're speaking to a new prospect, Part of my questioning process is to understand which side do they lean to more? Are they looking, do they need that emotional sort of, uh, you know, motivation to, to make a decision or are they not, they understand the emotional side and that's fine, but they just really know we need ROI from this. And based on that sense I get, um, that's kind of the way I, I phrase and frame things. So uh, I, I guess that leads to, to a question about questions and, and the process of really understanding your prospects what when you're when you're training sales teams and sales people how do you what do you coach on in terms of really this questioning process and understanding your prospect uh, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say because I, I'm very curious but I personally believe that the questions you ask and how you listen is the most important part number one of any sales process so I'm, I'm really curious to hear your your thoughts on that um i mean it's fundamental to being able to be really successful in sales uh your ability to question people and then listen to the answer and you know what we're coaching people around first of all is is helping them have a realization that our human tendency is to talk about our proposition right it's to tell it particularly if we're passionate about it we just want to share it with people and so you've almost got to suppress that inner desire to tell people all about the great ways that you can help them and how good it's going to be. Um, and you, you're looking to get a share of voice where the prospect or the customer is talking really around about 70% of the time. You're only talking for about 30% of the time. And frankly, the only way to do that without it becoming awkwardly silent is to ask questions. And salespeople do know the importance of asking questions, but sometimes they lack a structure to asking mm. those questions. And what they're really doing is they're asking questions um, at times to lead a customer into a place that they want to lead them to, and then it can feel quite manipulative. So we have, um, uh, once we've built the desire in for people to, to actually ask questions as part of their sales process, we give them this structure. It, it's uh, something we call GRID, uh, and that's an acronym for for um, parts um, of information that you might want to go. So the G of grid is the goal. So I re I'm really interested in what the customer wants to achieve, what some of their goals are. They might have some buying goals. They might have some project plans. Uh, I'd like to get a sense of the motivation that sits behind actually getting a decision. Um, the R is for review. And in the review, this is what you typically find a salesperson doing as part of their fact find. So what's the current situation in the organization, some context to it. And what you're really looking for is any particular problems or challenges that the customer has 
which are going to lead you to potentially being able to support and help them in, in addressing those things. Um, the I uh, of grid then is the impact. So, you know, if a customer is going to share that they've got three, four, five, six problems with me, I want to help them understand the extent of those problems because sometimes they're just anecdotal. Hmm. You know, so a customer will give you evidence of a problem and say, look, the thing that I'm struggling with, Steve, is that um, our salespeople aren't selling enough. Now, it's very easy for a salesperson to jump in and go, well, I've got a solution for that. It's called sales training and it, away we go. But it's actually worth digging a little bit deeper and finding out the true impact of that. So when you say your salespeople aren't selling very well, um, how's that showing up as a problem in the business? And they might say, well, we're not hitting our revenue target. And then I'm going to say, well, by how far are you missing your revenue target? We're missing it by £300,000. Okay, all right. So now I know the extent of the problem. And it's a £300,000 problem, not just, you know, we're struggling to to be as effective at selling as we could. And that so also the helps you, really, uh, sorry, sorry. Ju just to jump in there, that, that also helps you understand how effective your solution is once you start implementing it, because you can actually check in and say, okay, well, we had $300,000 or a £300,000 gap there. After the sales salute, after our sales training, where are you now? It allows for that ROI. Yeah, yeah. If you go through that process, you know, you're you're basically helping the customer see the extent of the problem. You're building your own benchmark of success. Exactly. Yeah. Around it. Now it could be that I don't feel so confident that I can close the whole three hundred thousand pound challenge. But you know, I get a chance to say that. I say, look, I, I can't guarantee that we will get the three hundred thousand, but what if we could do 200,000 of that? You know, I'd be happy to put my guarantee against that. And then, it, you, you know, when you come to position the price, the cost of the solution, it's in the context of the return they're going to get. And, and I find that sometimes people, um, salespeople are um, lacking in their ability to really ask a series of questions to find out the true impact. Mm -hmm. And then it's harder for a customer to make an ROI decision. Mm -hmm. The final bit of grid is, is D for decision. So what are the steps that they will take to make a decision like this? Have they got a time scale in mind? Have they got any budgetary um, uh, restrictions or have they got a budget in place so they need to go and win the buzz budget? Um, who else might be involved in that decision-making process? And the way that we've structured grid is it's a go anywhere, go everywhere model. So I will just draw a grid on a piece of paper. Actually, I use my iPad for notes, but I'm just going to draw a grid and I'm going to go, OK, this is going to keep me on track. I don't need any more than that to make sure that I'm structuring my questions effectively. And then, you know, one of the other things that quite often I find salespeople miss is they don't summarize back to the customer what they heard before they move into telling them about how they might be able to help with the solution. Mm -hmm. And the grid allows you just to, having captured a few bullet points around those things to really structure your feedback to the customer so they, A, feel like you listen to them, and many customers say salespeople just don't listen. And B, that you fully understand what they said. And at that point, they've got a chance to um, make sure that any misunderstanding is, is fixed. Or if you missed anything, they can say, Steve, no, you missed this. Uh, but now we're in a place where we've gone from inquiry without questions to advocacy based on this understanding I now have, I know the solution that's going to help meet your needs. Yeah. I, I, I love this process grid. Is, what I like about it is it's very simple. Cause there are these, there are other uh, sales processes, which uh, now that we're talking about completely blanking on all the terms, but there's these like acronyms. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're aware of them. Um, we do love an acronym here as well. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good acronym? <laughs> um, but but grid is great because it, it's it's very simple uh, and you can remember the four things. Um, yeah, goal, review, impact, decision, and and like you said, just draw a little um, four by four or two by two uh, yeah. square, and and there you go. Um, and it's um it's simple, but it's not simplistic. There is a no. nuance to grid, and it was it was really correct because you know my background is sales, but also coaching. I did a master's in coaching, right. and you know one of the one of the great coaching models is Grow G R O W. Probably no surprise that grid is G R I D, <laughs> four letters, and the goal is the goal. It's the same in coaching. You know that's what you're trying to do. There are differences in Grow, but actually, I think great salespeople um, 
are, are great coaches. I think they have that ability to listen and then uh, because essentially in sales, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what the customer's problems are and help them achieve something that maybe they couldn't achieve without without thinking through the process. Mm-hmm. And grid flows, at, you know, its genesis is in coaching questions. That makes sense. Um, you just said great salespeople are great coaches. And, and this is um, kind of a bigger question about the sales profession and just selling in general, because I thought I heard you say that you're very proud to be a salesperson. I'm also very proud to be a salesperson, but there are, but the sales profession has a lot of negative connotations. You know, I mean, used car salesman, immediately you get a very negative view of what that person is. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people see salespeople as slimy and dishonest and and this, that, and the other, but you're saying great salespeople are great coaches and coaches are wonderful people. So, I mean, why are you proud to be a salesperson? And, and I guess the bigger picture or the bigger, broader question to that is why is selling good? <laughs> why is selling good? Uh, why am I proud? I'm proud because um, I think at its best, um, selling is all about helping other people make great decisions mm. um, around, you know, products or services that that might be able to help them. And I think a truly professional salesperson is able to understand that it's not about their own individual success. It's about the client's success. And when the client's successful, your success is derived from that. Um, and sadly, the reason why, you know, there is a view of salespeople as, as maybe being, um, pushy, manipulative, et cetera, is that there are a number of people who are like that, who are in the profession. Uh, And that's because they're in it because they're just looking to achieve their own target or they want to hit some commission structure. And, you know, probably about 20 years ago, my sales approach changed when I realized that actually it wasn't about me, it was about the other person. And as soon as I switched my intent to really trying to understand the other person and what it is that they need and whether um, there was any way that I could positively help, but without having to put the pressure of, I have to sell you something. Right? And when you remove the pressure of selling, there's a great irony. You remove the pressure of selling, you tend to sell more. <laughs> so um, it's probably a long way of answering why I love sales. It's, it's, it's because ultimately you're looking to help people if your intent truly is in that space. It's given me a career. Um, that has been rewarding, uh, not only because of, you know, helping people, but it's been financially rewarding over the years. And I've met people all over the world that I probably wouldn't have met if I didn't follow this career. And I've worked with many organizations with really interesting products and services. And, um, you know, pretty much in sales, every day is quite different. So it's an interesting career, or it can be. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank thank you for that. I completely agree with you. I, I absolutely, as you were describing this, I was just thinking about my experience in sales and I, I love selling so much because it's just like what you said. I mean, selling is this process of meeting interesting people and they share with you some of their challenges and you have this incredible opportunity to, to hear someone out and say, I may be able to actually help you. And in that process, we will both win. Um, and just like you said, if you're, if you're approaching it from that point of view, it's this very much like, let's collaborate together on how we can do this you're, you're telling me your challenges and issues. And I can tell you, I, I hear what you're saying. And based on what you said, here's what we have. How does that work? How does that sound for you? And let, let's, let's sort of collaborate and see where, where the, what are the bits that do work? What are the bits that don't work? Can I sort of change my offering to make it work? better for you because assuming I've gone through, you know, well, in in your case, the grid process, and I truly understand what the challenges are. I'm, we're we're now like these two people who are trying to make something work. And we've, I think everyone listening to this right now, and just in general, people can relate to the fact that we love to buy things. Buying is fun. (laughs) Like, you know, if you buy something you really want, it's so much fun, but we just don't like being sold. And I think that that's the distinction as well between a good salesperson and a bad salesperson or, or a pushy salesperson, shall we say, is um, a pushy salesperson will try to sell you something, whereas a good salesperson will help you buy. 
and that feels great. Mm. Uh, and it, it's a completely different experience. Well, it does remind me, uh, we, we did a big um, sales training program for an organization and, and the word sales was relatively toxic in, in their organization. Which is the a people shame. who were selling didn't like to be seen as salespeople because of all those negative connotations right. you can get. Um, so we called the program Helping Customers Buy. Now it, it was it was uh, it was it was sort of a a magic trick because fundamentally we were teaching individuals how to sell right but it was just repositioning this idea that actually to your point people hate being sold to but they love buying things so mm -hmm. yeah we had we had helping customers buy and helping businesses buy for the commercial um, organizations that they were looking to sell to. Yeah, I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I find also just, that, and I'd be curious to know if you agree with this, I find that the sales process is frequently just repositioning and re reframing. People say, I have this huge problem. And sometimes I just say, well, actually, that sounds like a great opportunity to X, Y, Z. You know, and, and even that sometimes, that's part of this great coaching. A great salesperson is a great coach. It's just, if you re, if you can help the person, your, your customer or your prospect, see the situation slightly differently, then you're actually helping them. Even if they don't end up spending any money with you, the purpose of a salesperson is to help. Um, and sometimes, I mean, the number of times I've turned people away and say, we don't have the right product for you based on what you're saying, because I'm, I'm listening yeah. closely. It sounds like you need this. Did you realize that? And they say, oh, no, I didn't know that that was what I was looking for. Great. That's for me, that's a, a win because I've helped someone and they are now going to look back on me and, and our company as, as someone who's not trying to just sell them something, but actually trying to help. And I think that's a really helpful and important um, shift in, in approach to sales. Yeah, absolutely. And look, let's, let's not hide from the fact that actually when you win a deal, it feels great. Absolutely. <laughs> it's fantastic. I just got some news today on, <laughs> on a message uh, saying you've, uh, you've won the contract. We want to start in the next two to four weeks. And it's on a Friday, right? For me, there's no better feeling than a Friday win. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. So, Congratulations. And equal, thank you. Equally, um, equally, you've got to have some pretty thick rhino skin because you don't win all of the time, you know, regardless of how well you think you can support and help the customer. Sometimes they either don't make a decision to go forward or they choose somebody else because they think that was a better solution. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are times when, when you've got to, you know, go through the pain of losing, Absolutely. Um, but at least we get a slight emotional roller coaster in sales. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, one thing I've learned just as part of that is uh, the important importance of not counting your chickens before they hatch. And yeah. Well, then... yeah, it's never, it's never done until the contract signed. And even then, you're probably better waiting for the money to come into the bank. <laughs> for me, that's that's when the sale is closed when the money is in the bank because a contract signed is it's nice, but it's just a piece of paper. Still at risk. Yes. Yeah. When the cat when the cash is in the bank, <laughs> there's a there's a feeling of certainty that that's maybe right. this that's this when you can activity. yeah exactly that's when you can ring the bell. So you, you said that you've been in, in sales for, for 30 years. Was there a moment when you realized that you actually wanted to move into training and coaching specifically? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, uh, and, you know, actually, so my, my uh, potted, potted history of career, my career was that I was, um, I was sponsored by Jaguar Castle University. And I was sponsored by their commercial buying department. So initially I was um, going to be a buyer. Oh, cool. So it's interesting having ended up in sales that I was going to be on the other side of the fence. Right. Uh, and I found that interesting, um, but I uh, I was doing a business studies degree. And at the time in the early 90s, uh, there was quite a heavy focus on marketing. And marketing seemed really sexy and quite exciting. And uh, so I pursued um, a career in marketing to start with, and that was at Vauxhall Motors, mm -hmm. um, which was part of GM at the time. Right. Uh, and I, I spent three years in the marketing department, but to progress at Vauxhall, you really had to go and have some sales experience. So my next natural step was to be an area sales manager looking after a territory 
Um, and that's what I did for a further three years. And it was at that point that I really fell in love with sales. Mm. I had this buying background. I had this marketing background. Um, but sales, uh, I found um, I, I was really quite passionate about. And at that point, I was selling through others. So really, it was an influence sale. I was trying to encourage car dealerships to be more effective in their selling of new and used cars and other bits and pieces. Uh, and then I, I stepped into a direct sales job for BMW, where we were selling um, company cars and employee car um, ownership schemes, which at the time, there was a tax advantage to doing that. And that's where, uh, for the first time ever, my income was directly influenced by how good I was in selling, because they switched to a pretty high commission base on a base salary. Mm -hmm. And um, I was passionate about it anyway. But when you start to see that what you do is making a difference to your own personal reward, and it's quite, you, you know, sales, I think it's Michael Keenan says, you know, salespeople are the elite athletes of the business world because not many others put a chunk of their salary at risk in the way that salespeople do. So there is a risk, but it brings a sense of excitement and passion to what you're doing. So I was doing that at BMW, and then a, a colleague of mine left to join a company called Franklin Covey, which was one of the biggest training companies in the world. Um, Stephen Covey, you might know, uh, was the author of a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And they built out a whole um, a portfolio of leadership training, um, team performance and personal effectiveness training under that. And they were looking for salespeople to sell their products. Right. So we were selling training programs, workshops. We're also selling the materials that go alongside that. So at the time, if you did a if you did a Franklin Covey workshop, you would also um, get a rucksack with a. I'm going to call it a file of facts. <laughs> it was it was a planner. It's called a Franklin planner, but it was effect. For, sorry for your younger members of the audience. It's effectively a file of facts. So you're selling these products and you're selling these workshops. And um, uh, I was really enjoying doing that. But while I was there, I was I was observing the coaches who were delivering the training. And I'm like, wow, I really want to do that. <laughs> I want to still sell, but I really want to do that as well. Um, and that was really the switch. So having gone into salesperson, Franklin Covey, I really wanted to get into the coaching and the delivery of some of those workshops. Mm. Um, but it didn't really work out for me, uh, Franklin Covey, and being able to do that. Um, so I found an organization where I could start to learn how to facilitate and coach um, whilst also carrying a sales target um, for the the training that they were doing. And uh, I already knew that I was going to do this as a business. Uh, I didn't know when. I didn't know specifically what would be in there um, as an offer, but I knew that's where I was going. And two years later, that's exactly what I did in 2009, set, set, up, uh, set up my business and first of all, actually focused on leadership development, team performance and and personal effectiveness, because that was kind of the background that I'd been through mm -hmm. and the selling was alongside that. And then after four or five years of doing that, I noticed that my natural uh, my natural um, <clears throat> affiliation was towards sales teams. And, and, and actually, that's where my skill set, the ability to coach, but also having been a bag carrying salesperson really blended nicely. And uh, I still, you know, I still after a serious number of years and 20,000 plus salespeople, I still get a joy walking into a room and, and helping those salespeople be the best version of themselves. That's yeah, it's a great story. And I, I can imagine since you are so passionate about sales, helping other salespeople do better must give a really, it's a really uh, fulfilling feeling. I imagine. Well, it's fulfilling. I mean, as you know, sales is a meritocracy, right? So if you're better at it, you tend to have better life options yep. <laughs> fundamentally. And the other truth about sales is that you don't necessarily need any qualification to be great salespeople. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many highly qualified people in sales, you know, and it may not be a sales qualification that they have. You know, you've got people with PhDs and all sorts that are in sales. Um, but equally, you've got some very unqualified people and, you know, their lives have been enhanced because they're good at selling, which maybe they would have struggled in another walk, you know, another aspects, another function. Very true. When you do your sales training, are there any key takeaways that you always hope that your 
sales teams that your your training or salespeople take away or walk away with? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, there, there's a whole range of different things that we train people in that come under the umbrella of sales. Um, you, you know, there are some core selling skills. And the takeaway that uh, I want um, is that people have been provoked to think about how they practice their sales with their customers. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean practice as in you're going to do a role play before you see a customer. I mean the practice of selling um, to a point where they've gone away recharged to actually be more curious uh, with their questions and um, care more about the customer. And I think those two things sometimes go missing if you get a bit jaded in the sales profession, I think you lose your curiosity. You start assuming that you know the answer to the questions you're going to ask because you've met so many customers like that. But actually, there is still value in that curiosity. Um, and do you care about the customer's result? Do you care about their win or have you just got focused on you know yourself? Mm. Um, and as, I would say the third thing around core sales skills, we really focus on a salesperson's ability to quantify the benefit that they can bring to the customer. And I find many salespeople struggle with this, with this, um, either the idea of it or the ability to do it very well. But if you can't quantify the benefit, it's really hard at times for a customer to see the value of it and make good decisions about whether this is going to give them the kind of return that they're hoping for. So we have a specific process to help us uh, to help salespeople quantify the benefit. And um, I love it when they go away and they they know they ne they can now do that. Um, and without wishing to take up too much time on the podcast, you know, if it was negotiation skills or pitching skills, there are other key takeaways that we would have around those topics. Sometimes we're not training people. Sometimes we're working on live opportunities. So we will get a sales team or even a multifunctional team from the organization. We will focus on their must-win deals uh, and we have a process that will deconstruct and reconstruct that deal so that it improves their chances of winning. Or at the very least, they realize they're not going to win earlier and they don't waste any more time and energy on that particular opportunity. Um, so, you know, what's the takeaway from that? Uh, well, the takeaway is go and win it because you're now in a better place to it. But also you're probably underprepared to win it. Mm -hmm. What what always comes out is that there's missing information. There's always more that could be achieved and found out that would enhance your ability to help the customer and maybe win more often. Yeah, well, all good points. And Steve, yeah, thank you very much for your time and for for walking through this with me. It's fascinating to hear your approach, and and I really like your your very people or person centric focus on the sales process because ultimately. A salesperson is selling to another human and people love being heard and understood and and that's how you build trust and also how you actually have a successful career in sales is when you truly understand what what the person sitting across from you whether it's virtual or or in person uh actually needs and wants and what their challenges are and what they're hoping to achieve because then you can position your product or service appropriately. So it's, uh, it's really nice to hear um, to hear that that approach. And it's great to meet a fellow salesperson who is uh, very passionate about their work because, yeah, aren't I find that there aren't too many of us. And uh, like you said, there are a lot of jaded salespeople. And, and I think that's a great shame because they salespeople can provide such an amazing service. So thanks for hopefully bringing that passion back into into people's lives as well. Cool. Well, look, I think there's a place for human beings in buying and selling for the foreseeable future. I uh, hope so. It's, uh, I think there are some things that we can do as, as humans that um, can't be replicated yet. But uh, I also think we're maybe not that far off artificial intelligent robots buying yeah. from artificial robots selling. <laughs> you know, just cut, out, just cut out the human part of the process. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when that date comes, hopefully I'll be long retired. Mm. Yeah, me too. But yeah, thanks again, Steve, and um, all Pleasure. the best with with the next parts of your of your coaching journey. Thank you, Daniel. Look, I've really enjoyed it. It's uh, it's been great um, answering your questions and having a chat.